Today on Truths That Transform. I believe that a great deal of the problems that we're having with marriage in this country today is due to that erroneous concept that love is the foundation upon which a marriage is based. Welcome to Truths the Transform, a production of D. James Kennedy Ministries. Make sure you stay connected to us on Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube by looking for D. James Kennedy Ministries. And also, check out our new podcast, City of God, on Spotify, Apple, and wherever you get your podcast. Marriage has fallen upon difficult times in America. Divorces are more prevalent than ever. And now even marriage itself is under constant redefinition. Why is that important? And how does it affect all of us? On today's program, we'll look at the blessings of marriage and how God offers those blessings to you. And we begin with a look at the current attack on marriage. Marriage is designed by God to be the fundamental building block of our society. So when marriage is undermined, so is society. Our own David Wright has more. Marriage is one of the most important institutions in our society, yet today it seems to be under attack. Those on the left, uh, they really don't like uh, basic Christian beliefs on things like gender, things like marriage. The progressive left realizes that in order to win elections, they have to divide the church. They have to seek ways to really uh, diminish the, the strength of the family and Christian community. Uh, and unless they can do that, then the left has a really hard time actually pushing forward agendas that they might have. Many don't realize that the radical left hasn't always held these beliefs on same-sex marriage. Up until 2008, many politicians such as Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama openly defended traditional marriage. With marriage, 20 years ago, they had the Defense of Marriage Act, where even all Democrats agreed that marriage should be between a man and a woman. Hillary Clinton believed that, Bill Clinton believed it, Barack Obama believed it. However, in 2015, the political tide turned dramatically when the Supreme Court handed down the Obergefell decision, which legalized same-sex marriage across all 50 states. Now they're at the point where if you don't believe that marriage can be between a man and a man or a woman and a woman, you're a hater. After the Supreme Court overturned the infamous Roe v. Wade decision, there were concerns by the radical left that the Supreme Court would reverse the Obergefell decision as well. You know, the Supreme Court decided uh, the Obergefell v. Hodges decision back in 2015. Uh, but the reason, this, which really forced marriage, same-sex marriage, on all 50 states, well, the reason this was brought up is because in the Dobbs decision that overturned Roe v. Wade, in a concurring opinion, Justice Clarence Thomas suggested that other precedents should be looked at, including Obergefell. Well, obviously, the House Democrats uh, kind of, uh, that, that made them very nervous. And so Nancy Pelosi, back in July, uh, very quickly, within 48 hours um, from announcing the bill, announced that they were going to vote on a bill uh, called the Respect for Marriage Act that would repeal DOMA, uh, as well as uh, codify the Obergefell decision. Congress passed the Respect for Marriage Act near the end of 2022, upholding same-sex marriage under federal law. The badly misnamed uh, Respect for Marriage Act disrespects the American people and threatens uh, the fundamental freedoms of its citizens. The Respect for Marriage Act seems to be one of those unnecessary bills that either uh, is in search of a problem or, or simply a divisive mean or a deceptive means to be able to go after religious individuals and, uh, and the organizations that they put together. This new law raises serious religious liberty concerns. Those who simply follow their Christian conscience could find themselves in a world of legal trouble. The respect for marriage has a lot of implications for religious freedom going forward. Uh, for one, it gives the Internal Revenue Service a new tool to threaten the tax-exempt status of religious nonprofits that, that believe what the Bible teaches 
about marriage and about the distinction between the sexes and about sexual morality. It also makes cases, religious liberty and free speech cases, more difficult to win. And finally, it creates an enormous litigation and liability risk for faith-based organizations that simultaneously work with the government and live out their beliefs about marriage. The big danger though, I think, is that uh, it unleashes a bit of lawfare upon religious individuals and uh, the organizations, the institutions that they, they work with, uh, because it provides this private right of action to people to go after uh, those that want to um, uh, believe that marriage is between one man and one woman, because that's what the Bible teaches them to believe. And so for the politically vindictive, I think you're going to see them taking advantage of this law. The ultimate objectives of, of folks on the other side of these issues is to essentially force organizations and individuals to change, to get with the program, to embrace modern orthodoxy about sexuality, or in the alternative to shut down. Many argue that the government shouldn't be involved in marriage at all, noting that marriage is a religious covenant. Marriage is a pre-political right. People come together naturally and get married and have children and have families. This is a natural human phenomenon. The, the state, you know, gives you a license, says you have to be a certain age, but the state doesn't create marriage. Marriage is a pre-political institution. But the only way the state could treat same-sex marriage the same as opposite-sex marriage was to say that biology doesn't matter. The biological correspondence between male and female is not what makes a marriage, it's your feelings. You know, it's, it's whether you have this, you know, close, close emotional connection. Well, we have lots of close emotional connections with lots of people. So which ones qualify as marriage? Well, the state says which ones. They want to tell religious schools that they can't hire faculty who live with uh, according to their moral standards. They want to force every business in the United States to allow people to use uh, private spaces consistent with their gender identity rather than uh, their bodily reality. They wanna force every employer in the United States to use people's preferred pronouns even when that conflicts with an individual's conscience and their beliefs about realities. This attack on marriage is part and parcel of the Marxist ideology that has been adopted by many radical leftists today where the destruction of the family is key. A consistently Christian worldview is an immediate threat to the left's agenda, which is why you have uh, leftists throughout history who have said those exact words. You know, Karl Marx himself identified Christianity as one of the chief impediments to the establishment of globalized uh, workers of the world uniting. It's very important to understand that Marx believed in the destruction of the family. The reason for that is, he said that oppression was the key to history. And in Marx's playbook, men oppressed their wives, parents oppressed their children, they took them to church, and God was the ultimate oppressor. So if we can remove all of that oppression, finally people will be free, they'll live together without crime, and uh, everything is going to move along and be happily ever after. The traditional concept of marriage has been virtually hijacked and has drifted further and further away from its biblically intended purpose. Jesus was asked the question regarding marriage. He says, in the beginning, God made them male and female. And the man shall leave the father, mother, cleave to his wife, the two shall become one. So they're trying to say, if you're really Christian, you'll let them teach stuff to, to little children that Jesus would never teach. So in other words, if you're really Christian, you won't act like Christ. That's their strategy, that's their tactic. And Christians, unfortunately, have been buying it, saying, well, I gotta tolerate this, I'm Christian. If you open the door to same-sex marriage, you open the door to everything else. It's either God's way or everything else. I specifically argued, well, what would be the objection to polygamy if you embrace same-sex marriage? What would be the objection to other iterations of sexual orientation, which by the way, I would, I would remind everyone, the most popular acronym is LGBTQIAP2S+. What's the plus there for? There are TEDx talks right now, there's a professor from Germany, Merjam Hine, who's arguing that, oh, they're not pedophiles or pederists, they're minor attracted persons, and minor attraction is just another 
sexual orientation. The Bible's not clear about every single issue that we face, but there are some issues such as the issue of marriage and sexuality where there's a thus saith the Lord. Uh, there's a chapter and verse. And if we're not teaching that from our pulpits, you know, our people in our congregations will hear it, but they'll hear it from the media, they'll hear it from Hollywood. Uh, but if they're not hearing from the pulpit, they're not gonna be hearing what God believes about these issues where, again, I think the Bible speaks clearly. America is in crisis. What we do now will echo down through generations. America can be saved, but not if we fail to act. We have an important book we'd like to send you called Seven Steps for a Nation in Crisis by D. James Kennedy and Jerry Newcomb. It contains meditations and prayers on the seven steps necessary to restore America and maintain God's shield over it, and we will send it to you at no cost or obligation to you. Contact us today and ask for Seven Steps for a Nation in Crisis to receive these powerful biblical solutions to the challenges America currently faces. The Bible tells us that we are born in sin which means we're naturally rebellious towards God. It's not a surprise then that something as fundamental as marriage would come under attack. God created it as a visual parable of Christ and his church. And Satan, who hates both, would certainly like to destroy this precious parable. The design for marriage is not simply some set of arbitrary rules to be followed. It's a gift from God for our good. My pastor and mentor, Dr. D. James Kennedy, shares more in his message, Maximizing Your Marriage. I suppose that all of us remember the famous story, Acres of Diamonds, where the author describes his long search for treasures and riches which took him around the world, only to bring him home at last, dejected, discouraged, and defeated. But then, to his surprise, to find his treasure right in his own backyard. Well, I think that's a parable of the life of many people. God has told us that the true treasure of life rests in relationships. First of all, in the relationship that we have with him. How many people have testified to the fact that they have sought for this and that and the other thing, wealth and fortune and fame, and have found them all, and have found their life still to be empty until they found God. Our hearts indeed are restless till they rest in Thee. Those words spoken so long ago by St. Augustine are just as true today. That the personal relationship of knowing Jesus Christ as our own Savior and friend and Lord and God is the most precious treasure in this world. And next to that, I think that God would have us to know that he has placed us in families in order that we might discover in the relationships here on this earth something of that special treasure that is to be found in the relationship above. Paul tells us in Ephesians that he speaks of the relationship of the husband and the wife as the relationship of Christ and his church. This is a great mystery, he says, but I speak concerning Christ and the church when he talks about the relationship of the husband and the wife. But what is a marriage based upon? Well, if we asked a lot of people that question, I, I suppose that we would finally discover that the answer was that a marriage is based upon love, and that love is the foundation of any true marriage. Well, that's a very beautiful sentiment, but it is not true. And I believe that a great deal of the problems that we're having with marriage in this country today is due to that erroneous concept that love is the foundation upon which a marriage is based. But a marriage is not built on love. A marriage is built upon commitment. And until we see this, there is little chance that our marriages are going to succeed. 
A marriage is a commitment to another person till death do us part. Marriage is not God's way of condemning people to a life sentence of misery. But rather, God also has a plan for improving our marriages, solving our problems, and making them what they ought to be. And we need to yield ourselves to be committed to the improvement of our marriage. Now, indications of a lack of such a commitment may be seen in attitudes such as this, oh, he'll never change. He's just like his mother. She'll never be any different than that. She's just like her mother. <laughs> and yet the whole thrust of the biblical message is that God can change people. And when we take the position that people will never change, we are flying right in the face of what God has said. Surely it's true that of themselves people don't change, but by the Spirit of God, the wonder of the gospel is that people can be changed by God. And God has a plan for doing that for us. So we need to be committed to the permanence of marriage, and we need to be committed to the improvement of marriage. And if people would be committed to those two things, it would have a an astounding effect upon the rate of success or failure of marriage in our world today. Well, that means that we need to make a priority in our life, a very high priority next to our relationship with God, to strengthen our marriages and our family relationships and to discover those acres of diamonds that lie right in our own backyard to find that oneness that Christ would have us to have. And God has ways of doing that. I think one of the best descriptions or formula that has been set forth has been set forth by Dr. Ed Wheat, who is a famous marriage counselor and physician and a speaker and author on the subject, who was here at our church about a year or so ago. In fact, when I say it is one of the best uh, formulae, I would point out to you that that is the, the acronym that he uses, BEST, B-E-S-T, and I would highly commend it to you for your consideration. The B stands for blessing. We read, of course, in the Bible about the blessings of God. The word blessing is from the Greek eulogia, which simply means to speak well of. And by blessing your spouse, it means to speak well to your spouse, first of all. That means that you're going to speak kindly to them, that you're going to be complimentary to them, that you're going to be encouraging to them in your words. We need to pray regularly God's blessings upon our spouse, upon their blossoming into what they would, God would have them to be, upon them knowing the fullness of joy that God would want them to experience. The B is for blessing. The E is for edifying. Edifying, of course, is a word that simply means to build up. We need to try to build up our spouse. The S of best is sharing. We need to learn to share ourselves one with another through taking, first of all, time to be with one another. And fourthly, the T in best is touching, according to Dr. Wheat. And he says that if we listen to everything else that he says in his book and ignore this one fact, we will never have the feeling, the continual feeling of romantic love in a marriage. God's plan is that that feeling of romantic love and excitement and ecstasy of marriage should grow all the way through your marriage. Now, I want to say that I believe that that is an idea that is totally alien and revolutionary to most people today. And this is essential for a marriage to grow. And my friends, I would ask you, is that, does that exist in your marriage? 
you must make up your mind. If you want to discover those acres of diamonds in that relationship that can exist in your own home, then apply that formula of blessing and edifying and sharing and touching. Just as Christ calls us to an ever-deepening relationship with him, a relationship which is established by faith in that love which he poured out to us on Calvary. And when we trust in his redeeming act of love, we find that that relationship is established and then can grow throughout this life and throughout eternity. Ah, my friend, what is your marriage life like? Disastrous, so-so, or terrific? May God grant you the deep desire and priority in your life to determine that you are going to apply God's principles to your marriage, regardless of anything else, and you are going to experience one of the most beautiful treasures to be found in this world, those acres of diamonds that lie right in your own backyard. Hi, I'm Jennifer Kennedy Cassidy. There's no question that marriage is declining in America today. The divorce rate more than doubled between the 1960s and the 1980s. Divorce has declined a bit since its peak, but that's mainly because fewer people get married at all now. The marriage rate in America is the lowest in its recorded history. And yet marriage is designed by God to be the foundational building block of society. It's no wonder that we find our world in such a mess. And it didn't happen purely by accident. There were those in positions of key influence who were planning and working to destroy traditional marriage. And they've been hugely successful in achieving that goal in hopes of bringing about a societal revolution. You can read all about it in the shocking book, Takedown, From Communists to Progressives, How the Left Has Sabotaged Family and Marriage by Dr. Paul Kengor of Grove City College. In this book, Dr. Kengor documents how the disciples of Karl Marx have actively plotted the overthrow of the traditional family so that they can rebuild America on a Marxist foundation. Unless we see how the dots are connected when it comes to cultural Marxism, we're never going to effectively oppose the godless destruction of our institutions. From critical race theory to same-sex marriage, the new Marxists have worked to unravel our nation with great success. Learn what they're doing to marriage and how they've done it in this eye-opening book, Takedown, From Communists to Progressives, How the Left Has Sabotaged Family and Marriage by Dr. Paul Kengor. And if you're able to give a generous donation of $40 or more, we'll send you the book plus the four DVD set of messages from my dad, Dr. D. James Kennedy, entitled The Importance of Marriage. You saw just a portion of one of these messages a few minutes ago, and this DVD set includes the entire message plus three more. In these messages, my father examines the forces at work to undermine marriage, unfolds why marriage as designed by God is so vitally important and offers biblical truth to strengthen your own marriage. That's the book, Take Down from Communist to Progressives, How the Left Has Sabotaged Family and Marriage from historian Paul Kengor as thanks for your generous donation. And the book plus the four DVD set, The Importance of Marriage, featuring four classic messages from Dr. D. James Kennedy as thanks for your donation of $40 or more. I think you'll agree that you simply aren't finding these truths being proclaimed on most television programs. Your generous partnership allows this ministry to proclaim the truth and cut against the grain of the culture with the word of the living God. We will not shrink back but we need your help to produce and air these quality television programs, which are expensive to do. Simply write to us at D. James Kennedy Ministries, Box 11154, Fort Lauderdale, Florida, 33339, or call toll free 877-962-7677, or go online to djkm.org. Many of our biggest cultural battles are about definitions. 
how do we define things like man, woman, and marriage, and according to what standard? For most of human history, marriage has been the union of one man and one woman. This is as God designed it, a lifelong bond that is so important that the Bible uses it to illustrate the relationship between Christ and the church. But what has happened in recent decades is that marriage has been removed from its foundations. Rather than a sacred covenant bond between one man and one woman who pledge to spend their lives together and fulfill certain important obligations, it became a mere social arrangement for our own personal satisfaction. But if it's merely a social arrangement, then why does it need to be permanent? Divorce became more common and easier, something to resort to when one or both spouses decided they simply weren't getting personal satisfaction in the marriage anymore. And if it's a social arrangement, why does it need to be between a man and a woman? Well, our culture decided it doesn't. Now it can be the union of two men or two women, though we're no longer able to say what either of those things actually are. And what's so special about the number two anyway? If marriage is just a social arrangement, why can't it be between whatever number of people we want? Predictably, there is now a push for such multiple partner marriages. The defense of marriage has never been about who can get married. It's about what marriage actually is. Who gets to define it? A culture that has defined it as a temporary romantic social arrangement between any consenting people has reaped a harvest of broken homes and devastated children. Children who grow up in homes without both parents or parents who are not married to each other reach lower levels of education on average. They have far higher rates of unemployment, unmarried pregnancy, and depression, among other pathologies. That's because ignoring God's design for our good has terrible consequences, while embracing his design leads to flourishing. Our culture's attempts to redefine marriage are really an attempt to overthrow God and his design. And the solution is not to double down on our rebellion, but to repent. We can't change what marriage actually is any more than we can change what gravity is. At ignoring reality, only puts us in danger. Thank you for joining us today. Remember that you're always welcome to come worship with us at Coral Ridge Presbyterian Church in Fort Lauderdale. And you can also join us by live stream at crpc.tv. Thanks for being with us. And here's a look at the next Truths That Transform. Connecticut being the constitution state affected our US constitution, which starts off with we the people. That's next week. This has been a production of D. James Kennedy Ministries.